So I guess we're ready to start, so I'm going to do my shtick and just so you know, I'm retired, so you don't have to panic. I'm not going to look at your name tags and do an inspection, although I have done a lot of them. I've done about 120 fatalities on my own and probably supervised another 150 as a supervisor. So 34 years working with OSHA. It's a wonderful experience, by the way. I got to see how everything was built, except cars, because it was AMC. You put the parts in. Uh, but everything, and it was pretty slick. Um, I got to do a lot of accidents. Um, years ago, I was when I was young, dumb, and stupid, I was a grunt medic in Vietnam, so I ended up doing a lot of fatalities when I came to work for OSHA because I did fatalities back then. So, Number one, side that a violation by OSHA. Was it HASCOM? Which is pretty common because you all have to have a HASCOM program. Walking and working surfaces. 4% uh, of all fatal falls occur on the same level, by the way. Respiratory protection, machine guarding, or power transmission. It's really none of these, because the number one is lockout. And it tends to get cited easily because you don't do the audits. You don't cover every machine, like this little compressor that's behind us. It's easy to spot. So when I work for OSHA, lockout's pretty common. It's generally on everyone. Also in the directives on enforcement, Lockout is one of the things that everybody's going to be looking at because it is an issue. So if you're going to do an inspection, you're going to look at lockout programs. And that tends to come into play. So every COSHO is short for Compliance, Safety, and Health Officer, which is what the Compliance, Safety, and Health Officers are with OSHA. And it's not short for the French COCHON, which means pig, so don't go there. <laughs> Number one violation is failure to implement. <coughs> Failure to develop specific procedures. So if you miss a, machi miss a machine, what have you <coughs> forgotten to do? Development and document. And then utilize. So if you don't enforce it, it becomes an issue. Periodic inspection of the energy control procedure. So you don't audit it. And you don't enforce it. Do not use the line, it was employee misconduct, if you cannot show that you are auditing on a regular basis and enforcing. It's not going to fly. If I really want to do something on an OSHA inspection, I look at when your enforcement documents are done and I look to see if there's an injury there. And if there's an injury in an enforcement document and no other enforcement documents on disciplining people, then I know you have a reactive program, not a proactive program, and you're not ahead of the curve. You're, you're just being reactive. You're not being proactive. And that's one of the problems that we see a lot of, is you say it's all the employee's fault, but the only time you ever enforce it is when somebody's injured. And that's wrong. So you have to show that documentation. Failure to provide training. So we ask the employee, were you trained on lockout? And we get the three-letter response, which is? Yes. Video. Sometimes yes, and sometimes, huh? <laughs> if you don't document that they were in the training, were they trained? And that's why you have to document. So you need to keep that documentation current. And failure to clearly outline the scope and the rules to be utilized and the means to enforce compliance. So who's going to audit? Who makes it clear? And that's going to be an issue. November 19th, 2010, 1,500 hours, maintenance mechanic Mr. X was conducting maintenance on the CNC drill machine. When the machine was activated, crushing, crushing, crushing his hip. He died on December 12th, 2010. Is this good? Crushing blow on a hip you're more likely to have a cardiac event because of the, blood, the, the different blood cells that come in there. So you get the clot that comes in. You may have a stroke downstream from that clot. Um, I've seen this happen several times on broken, broken femurs, broken pelvic bones. And you've got a company that is the video running in there. There it gets running. OK. This is a security video. Oh, the 
clothes can't go into the dryer. So what are we going to do? So it's warm, he's being tumbled. What's wrong? What just happened? He didn't lock it out. He died. He didn't lock it out. They had other videos apparently that showed people doing the same thing and never getting disciplined. And these are the citations that were issued. Let's see. 5A1, 7,000. Sirius, 5,000. Sirius, zero because it was grouped. 7,000, 7,000, 7,000. 70,000 now. Hmm. So, item by item, instance by instance, this is known as egregious. Except that he was doing it repeatedly before that everybody was telling him it's okay. Because that's how they were doing it. Because is it more efficient in terms of time? Let's see, how many more documentations do we need? Total was 46 violations. 2.7 million. And I understand that there's another one that occurred similar. Main causes of the injuries? Failure to stop it? Failure to disconnect from the power source? And this is what people don't identify. All the different power sources. Just like that little compressor. Um, I will take, I've got a little Bostitch compressor that I'll take to do training on lockout. And I'll say, this is cord and plug. What can I do with it? Oh, unplug the cord. What do I have in that air receiver? I have compressed air. And many people miss that. And then there's actually a spring in there. Inside there on the valves that can actually spring. So welcome to trivia. Dissipate, bleed energy, bleed off that energy. Procedure to be done. Accidental restarting. So I've got a lockout procedure for the lights in this room, and I have a three-way switch. One on the entrance to the front, one on the exit. So I put a lock on that switch. Have I locked out the power? That's right. I have to lock out, too. So the electrician that years ago I was doing an inspection of, and he was on the ladder working on one of the lights, and he had locked this out in a big, large auditorium where there's one entrance here, one entrance on the other side. He's up on a ladder on the top working on it. And he has it locked out. He's got one of those little switch plates that you put right over the switch, screws it in, locks it out, puts his lock on there. The guy comes in from the other side, flips the switch. Well, he's working with the electrical on top of the ladder. What happens to him? Shock, and he's on top of the ladder. Where's he go? Gravity is the one law you can't break unless you're a spaceship. And he falls, breaks something, and OSHA gets a complaint. Whose fault? Was he trained? That's, that's where the work comes into play. You've got to document your training if you're going to say he wasn't. He was trained or he wasn't trained. If you don't document it, it didn't happen. I've been in enough attorney's offices where if it's not in writing, it doesn't exist. Pat. On that lighting system you described, it, it technically has two sources of power then, because of two switches. Does it need a procedure, or because of the lighting system is it exempt? The lighting under OSHA, if you're working on a lighting system for the solar lights in the room, OSHA still has that 1989 NFPA interpretation in there, NFPA standard in there. The new one, as we're, the new 70E, um, as of 2004 and the 2009 and the 2012, remove that. 
I could have disconnected it just by going to the disconnect at the panel, which the guy did not do. But he had two sources, so if he's going to use that in the room, he would have to identify so they would both. So they have some procedure for that, technically. So yes. Like that. <clears throat> or go back to the box and have one have a procedure for that for the lockout. But the issue is that most people don't know where it is in the panel because how many people here have their panels identified at home to where they know what can be turned off and what isn't? And how many people just go, I'll keep flipping these switches until that's off? Plug a radio in? Well, yeah. Then you can hear it go off. Then you can hear it go off. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've actually used that on the one-man operation, so you are right, um, and it works. Um, but te technically, the lighting example is there's still only a single source. It goes back to the disconnect, and it right. can be isolated in a single source, so, so therefore, no procedure. Uh, you still need a procedure because you have to identify where it's fed from, and you have to clean, clearly identify where it's, what controls the lighting surface, and most panels aren't going to have that. The, the vast majority of panels, I bet if I would go into the lighting panel for this building, I would probably find some errors. So, not that I'm cynical, but... Mine, by the, by the way, my house is fully mapped out. I know where the... I've got a one-line diagram on my house. I know where the cords go. I know where the wiring goes. Because if I ever have to testify on the stand again, I'm going to be able to say, oh, yeah, I even do that at my house. And trust me, that when I feed the, the line to the attorney when I'm testifying, he'll ask that line. Or, better yet, set up a, uh, a landmine for the opposing counsel and have the opposing counsel ask it, because then it's not subject to rebuttal. I have litigated, by the way. Spent a lot of time in the courtroom. Events, fatalities, failure to stop, disconnect, all this stuff. I just went the wrong way. Why lock up? Protect workers. You isolate the hazardous energy. De-energize the circuits. Block moving parts, which most people don't understand. Neutralize extreme temperatures. And one of the things that was brought up is the cryogenics these days. I see a lot of cryogenic work going on in facilities. I also see a lot of hot stuff going on. Chemical exposures. How many people here work in the food processing industry? Do a clean in place. Mix sodium hydroxide and milk sugars. What do you have? Carbon monoxide gas. Has to be at uh, about 110 degrees Fahrenheit. It's not that hot. You're right. But I did a fatality on a tanker cleaning operation where that's exactly what the guy did with sodium hydroxide. So, the mixing can be a problem. There's a lot of stuff. OSHA wants you to work safely, and I used to do this same presentation when I was with OSHA, because I wrote it there. And I just took stuff with me when I left, because I had done most of the stuff on my 10 hours after 40 hours. Let's just say 50 hours a week was a normal time frame. Lockout tag out. There's interactive training stuff online. What is OSHA in terms of the safety? It's the minimum wage of safety. It's not the maximum. So it's not going to give you full compliance. It's going to give you full compliance with the standard, but not full safety in the facility. So you've got to look at going over and above, because it is a minimum wage of safety. It has questions and answers, all sorts of things on lockout tagout. So there's a lot of tools. NIOSH, nothing brings it through to your people like getting information to them as to why you lock out, why you tag out. There's a NIOSH publication 99-110, preventing worker deaths from uncontrolled release of electrical, mechanical, and other types of hazards. Failure to lock out and tag out all devices after de-energization, 11% or 17 out of 152. It's a lot of fatalities, isn't it? Just in the study. And failure to verify that the energy source was de-energized before beginning work. So I pull that disconnect out. And it's off, right? And I don't go back with my meter. What happens? 
has the potential to still be on. Yeah, because I've had failures. I've had arms down, and my switch is still in. And the knife and the blades are still in because nobody maintained them, and they kind of welded themselves in there. When the person had to use that pry bar to bring it down, they broke that old plastic. And actually, I've got some pictures of an event that I'll show tomorrow. What's required to comply? You keep the employees from uncontrolled energy. So you document, you set up your procedures. Standard covers servicing and maintenance of machines in which the unexpected energization or startup or release of energy could cause injury. So what machines does this cover? It's easier to say which ones this doesn't cover. Doesn't apply to construction, ag, and maritime employment. However, there are other standards out there. PowerGen has different ones. Electrical is covered by subpart S in this area and then under, under a different standard in construction. But you have to have work practices if you're going to do energized work. And also, we see that most people don't document those. Going to look for chemical, thermal, gravity, radiation, electrical, mechanical, hydraulic, and pneumatic. So this is what OSHA defines any source of energy like this. Doesn't apply to cord on plug. Hmm. If we only have one hazard and it's under the exclusive control, and we only have one energy source. So if it's that drill and we have no accidents, we're fine for a while until we have an incident. So you set up a blanket procedure on making sure that people are in control of the plug. Because people have to be able to do this. Determine if the hazard is controlled by unplugging the equipment. And when I bring my compressor in here and it's unplugged and I sit it here and I tell people, OK, hold on to this hose, what do they tell me? And we're going to let the air blow right into your skin because it's over 90 PSI. Are they going to do it? What's the threshold on going into your skin, by the way? 30. That's pretty good. Everybody knew the answer. Also, it's one of the easiest things for OSHA to check because we have these little gauges. And you just plug it into the end of the compressed air for cleaning and tells you what the dead end pressure is. And that's one of the things that we look at too, so that and grinders. You must determine if it's controlled by under unplugging the equipment. So you still look at the compressed air. I still need to control the plug so it gets, doesn't get re-energized. So I've got plug locks that I use. 47A have to have a program for affixing lockout devices or tagout devices. And when do we use a tagout device? When it's infeasible to put a lock device on. So if we can't put a lock on, and basically anything made since 1992 has to have that ability to be lockable. So that's pretty much going to be everything. I hate tags because what can I do with a tag? Remove it. And what's the most common device used to defeat a lock? Bolt cutter. Bolt cutter, you're right. And not that anybody here would ever do that, but several people came up with that same response, so that tells me. So if somebody leaves their lock on, what do you do? And they go home at night. Call them back in. Call. Call them back in, verify where they are, and if you can't get a hold of them, what do you do? Check the equipment because one time on an inspection, the guy was found inside the muller for the sand system. But it was hours later when they found him after the muller had been running. Sand was of a very poor quality for castings, by the way. I think the worst fatality I ever did was on Easter Sunday where I had a a guy who was came in to do some work, really good worker, 
came in on Easter Sunday in the morning to get a product out for just-in-time delivery where the company wanted it the next morning at the plant. Good guy. Wife calls, you know, he's not home yet for lunch, you know, for Easter, you know, going to church on Easter Sunday. So they go look at the machine, they find him stuck inside the machine. He died because of positional asphyxia. Because the lockout procedure for the machine did not include the the air and spring system for the alignment plate. So as this guy was working in there, the air bled off, the spring kicked in, and it caught him. And he was stuck in there. And the family showed up on to, to, the, to the company site that day. If ever you don't want to deal with something, it's the family of somebody who's still stuck in the machine as they're trying to get him out. Mm -hmm. And they all wanted to go see what happened. I got called several things by telling them, you know, you really don't want to go. And finally we ended up having one of the family members go because the police and the sheriff were there. And one guy comes up to me and says, you're right, I shouldn't have gone. Because it was not a pleasant scene. If you have contractors, do you have any of your people exposed to a hazard that the contractor creates? So they're working on your equipment. Do they have a lockout procedure for it? You got to deal with your contractors. You need to control the exposure. So an electrical contractor is working and the panel's wide open. Is that a safe thing or not? Normal production. If in compliance with OSHA guarding and other standards, so I take the guard off to do work on that machine and I'm just doing a quick product change. Do I have guards on it? Then I'm in lockout mode. So we're looking at normal production. If an employee, normal production operations are covered by the standard only if an employee is required to remove or bypass a guard or other safety device or required to place any part of his or her body in, into an area on a machine or piece of equipment where work, work is performed upon the material. Or where an associated danger zone exists. So I'm going to adjust the, just tighten up a screw. I'm going to do it quick and dirty. If it's not guarded by a guard, lockout comes into play. It's not guarded, it's in here. Employee's job requires him to operate a machine or equipment which servicing or maintenance is being performed mm -hmm. under lockout or tagout, or whose job requires him to work in an area where such servicing is being performed. That's an affected employee. So we have to train them too as to what the hazards are. Authorized, one who locks and tags it out. We train them and we document it. Which one requires more training? Authorized. Is that it? You don't have to worry about anybody else? Standard has an other. It's required based on the roles of the employees and the control of energy and the knowledge which they must express and show to do their tasks safely. So you still have to basically tell everybody if it's got a lock, or if there's a sign that says, do not enter, you don't go in. They have to be aware. Do we document this ever? Do I, did I see it documented? Very rarely. When I ask the office people, have you ever been trained on lockout, what you're supposed to do when you go out in the plant, do you ever go out in the plant? Yeah. What do you know about lockout? Nothing. So they just have to be made aware. In a situation like that, for documentation, when we bring somebody in, we hire somebody new, they go through an employee orientation. Part of that is uh, a quick run through with lockout tag out as an, an overview. Right, just an overview. Yeah. Does that qualify? Sure. 
until you have a glitch and somebody does something wrong, in which case, who do you retrain? That person. Everybody? If there's something wrong, everybody needs to be informed of it. Exactly. And that's where the communication has to be. If somebody does something wrong, they go out there and they do something wrong, that's, or they get exposed to it. You know, if we have an instance and there's no remediation for that instance, do we have a prima facie case of knowledge and nothing being done? Correct. That's the issue. How far down it's going to go, how far down the food chain it's going to go, it's going to depend on the individual compliance officer doing the inspection and whether or not they go forward or not. Uh, so it all depends on what level of comfort you want for your own protection and for the company's protection. So. But remember, they have to at least be aware. And if I don't document it, does it exist? Three core, energy control, employee training, and periodics. Most common violations with OSHA. This is the low-hanging fruit, the periodic inspections. If it isn't done, it's easy to cite. Missing energy on a procedure. So I missed the pneumatic, I missed the spring in that pneumatic spring on Easter Sunday in 1992. Which, by the way, has screwed up every Easter Sunday for me since, because every Easter I remember that thing. And employee training, document it and keep it kept. They have to detail and document the specific information that an authorized employee must know. Scope, purpose, authorization rules, and techniques. And where the heck are the disconnects? Periodic, have to ensure that they're being followed. Periodic is no, more, no less than annually. If there are problems, you may have to do it more often if you have a constantly changing uh, system. So my friends at a large company that do a lot of energy control devices are making money right now. So they're changing the process constantly. So they're doing their evaluation almost on every three months. They're redoing their product lines and they're redoing their lockout procedures as they come into play. And by the way, the employees are involved in the setting up of the lines now, too, to facilitate it. Core three is employee training and retraining. And I hate tag-out systems, but they are allowed where you can't turn it off. So. At a minimum, specific statement and the intended use, procedural steps for the placement, removal, and transfer, and for testing to verify the energization. And by the way, if I'm using a device, if I'm using a cheap meter that costs me $3 at a large big box retailer for electrical, and I'm working in 480, is that no, a, no. appropriate? No. Not cat 3 or 4. You're right, exactly. Cat 3 or 4. So my really nice flukes that I bought are wonderful. My $2.99 will burn up. I've seen it. Oh. I do it in an electrical demo. I will literally <laughs> blow them up. Maybe good for home, but I'll bring one in tomorrow for you guys to play with. The quality of the control on there. I don't need it for each machine, but I'll tell you right now, if you don't have it for each machine and something gets changed, you're never going to modify it. You're never going to fix it because you won't catch it. So you can do it. It's legal. But if something's changed in that meantime, you're probably not going to modify it. So you need the procedural steps for shutting down, isolating, blocking, and securing, bleeding off pressures, venting pressures. Um, all valves leak, so if I assume that the valve is closed, you remember, even your heart valve is eventually going to leak. So you assume that valves are going to fail, so you have to check those pressures or bleed it off and set up the requirements for testing. Written procedures have to be out. If an employer develops procedures for electrical hazards, then you have to go to 1910-333, and we'll cover that tomorrow. Electrical safe work practices. Testing, everything else. So if I'm going to test on an electrical panel, I'm going to put my probes in there. 
What do I have to wear? Based on the potential hazard to which I'm exposed. So somebody has to figure out what it is. Either based on the tables in NFPA 70E or a study or whatever calculations you come up with that are accurate. I've seen some real questionable calculations. So, it's going to be tested. After a person has locked and tagged out the disconnect and verified, then you can take the clothing off. Well, to a certain amount, you should take the clothing off. Here's a little decision matrix on electrical safe work practices. Is hazardous energy exposure present? No, then you stop. So I, I'm not working on the electrical, I don't have an issue. So I'll cover this tomorrow, but you need to have an ESP, electrical safety program. Qualified workers, all that stuff. And FPA is evidence that the industry recognized Arc Flash. So I'll cut through this now. There's a link uh, to the website on effectiveness. And I think this is what you want to avoid. Here we have a guy, a qualified electrician with unqualified helper, 40, 480 VAC. Final circuit conductors were connected. The ground wire was accidentally shorted directly to the phase terminals, created an arc flash. Helper was knocked down, scuffed up a bit, had a loss of hearing, accompanied by a headache. Subsequent demise of the electrician of full force. And I've got some videos that I'll show tomorrow. Create a program, identify, identify the sources, identify the control points. And one of the things is to when you deal with both these guys and everybody else, have common, te have common terminology of what it is. So your people know what they're doing. If I have an electrical engineer come in, they may identify a circuit one, two, three, which you won't know what the hell it is. So. Periodic, you gotta do it, and minimum of an annual. So, Throw some questions at me because I'm not going to go any further on this. Um, although I want to make sure that people understand, I can't use an e-stop. How many people here have had the blue screen of death with their computers? So a programmable e-stop can be programmed out of the system. And we've had that happen. The equipment has to be isolated from the energy source and a programmed e-stop is not isolation. So we're looking at physical isolation. And I think I'll stop on there, but I want people to understand that OSHA has a big issue right now in non-English speaking. So you have to make sure that you communicate to them. And I'll give Jim the uh, copy on this so he can Get, a, you know, get it to you guys if you want it. So. Deficiency. A reasonable person would conclude that the employer had not conveyed the training to its employees in the manner they were capable of understanding. Then the violation may be cited. So just understand. It's there. So a friend of mine who did training at a large construction project in Texas um, after they did the training for the fall protection and they asked the people what they learned from the fall protection, the response was, the gringo wants you on a leash. <laughs> was that a failure? No. Misinterpretation. A little bit of a misinterpretation <laughs> as to the reason for fall protection. So... You guys take it easy. Any questions? None? I do. You were talking about your compressor where you miss an energy source. Yep. How do you, what's your recommendation for making sure that you've gotten every single energy source? Can you request the manufacturer if they 
give you that information? I mean, are they going to give you that information? Probably not. It's, you won't see that from the manufacturers because if they may, they may miss something too, so their lawyers are going to say, don't do it. Um, it's going to be you learn and try and figure out on your machines. But hell, for years, you know, people would tell me, unplug that compressor, you're fine. And I'm going, what about the air? Oh, never thought of that. So. So, question I mean, about going into and from. Pardon me? Basically, when you're doing a piece of machinery, if it's running, questioning everything going to it and from it. And within it. And within it. Check valves in it. Okay. Check valves, counterbalances, air counterbalances, um, weight counterbalances. Batteries. Batteries. Oh, big issue right now with UPS units. Um, because nobody pays attention to the UPS unit, uninterruptible power supply. But on programmed machines, sometimes you'll have these huge battery systems uh, that will maintain it for weeks, hours, days, months, depends whatever the design is. Um, I see battery rooms now very commonly. And tomorrow I'll throw in a video of an arc flash in the battery room. So there are DC arc flashes. And the new code in 2012 for NFPA actually addresses DC current, NFPA 70. So there is some DC stuff that's out there. Next. Is it a law? Pardon me? Is there a law for arc flash? What a company has to do, what they don't have to do, or Yeah, the OSHA, 333. Have to have an electrical safe work practice program. And you pick the PPE according to national consensus guidelines generally. And that is going to be NFPA 70E. OSHA hasn't adopted it, but it's there. If you don't have the program, we use it. Uh, sorry, they use it um, on a regular basis. Uh, matter of fact, one of the guys that wrote it, we hired in Boston. So Kenny works for OSHA now in uh, the Boston Regional Office. Most people are clueless about electrical safe work practices. Um, the electricians go up to a panel, don't change their clothes, they open up the panel, and they're exposed to a potential for arc flash. Uh, they do occur. On a statistics show there's probably about 10 arc flash incidents a day based on uh, some of the documents, so they do exist. And I've met the guys in the burn wards. Um, by the way, I've been in the burn ward myself because when I was a kid I made really good rockets and really bad fusions, so. <laughs> Twelve years old, I got to see the burn ward, so I got skin grafts on my thumb. So it felt wonderful, trust me. On your blood well. Here. Uh, and by the way, they have to bleed to a safe place. If you're going to be bleeding off a valve, you don't want to have it bleed off into an area where it's a toxic. It either has to go into a scrubber or something else. I want to make sure that people understand that on a bleed valve because we've had people open up valves and release chemicals into a facility. So it's got to go to some place that's designed for it. Sorry, I just meant to throw that in quick. Yeah, but, but if you know the... Uh the product or uh, the source, but then that pipe is corrosive to the valve itself. The valve integrity is in question. Even though if you turn that valve off, uh, how you're actually 100% sure that it's going to hold while you're performing your task. Well, I asked that right? I've in a sense uh, because I, I had a valve uh, at a refinery. And they actually broke the line and put a blind valve in. I'll see blinds put in, um, which, or I've seen shunts put in to where it's you know diverted to another system through a, a different, where you actually are able to bleed it off fully and keep the pressure off that line. But it's based on what the employer does to safely remove that energy source or that potential chemical release. Uh, the Chem Safety Board has a lot of nice documentation on this if you go to their website. And the chemicals are a huge issue uh, because you know, just if I mix the milk sugars in the 
sodium hydroxide together, I can get that wonderful carbon monoxide gas. Uh, or ammonia and bleach, which I had a roommate mix that when I was in college to clean the floor. Yes. Create some nice. Oh yeah. It cleans well too. Get by the way. Now. It does clean well. It cleans very well. But you've got to deal with those issues, and that's going to be done on a case-by-case -case basis at the employer to make it safe. Because they're the ones that are responsible for the safety. They have to evaluate their facility. And that's what works.